Good morning. I'd like to welcome all our viewers from around the world to Structural Heart Live Cases, broadcasting live from the Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. My name is Arash Salemi, cardiac surgeon and your guest moderator today. It is a pleasure for me to be here. The video of this broadcast, I'm reminded to tell you, will be available on the website later today. The last broadcast dated January 9th, 2018, and all previous structural heart cases are available now online at www.ccclivecases.org. During the course of the case today, we'd love to hear from you, so please email us any questions at info at ccclivecases.org. We have a great case for you uh, here today. I'd love to take you to the cat cardiac catheterization lab with Dr. Sharma, Kinney, and the rest of the team for the live case presentation. All right, good morning to our structural heart live cases viewers, and uh, this is our case number 22. Uh, and uh, today is the tower case. Uh, last time we did uh, uh, the mitral uh, valve and valve uh, sapien, uh, but this is uh, the more common uh, encounter disease of aortic stenosis and uh, with my team this introduction Dr. Keeney on the left side then we have our surgeon Dr. Tang then Kovacek another uh, um, interventionist and then two fellows uh, Farhan and Samit and who else we have uh, Dr. Gila Park in the echo and then we have our team of anesthesia so this case uh, we'll go through step by step uh, what we announced actually there is a little change in the program so uh, a patient with a, will get the evolute valve. The, we also announced on the web that we'll get a sentinel. But somehow, Sun, who is a doctor, internist, did the research and he said there is no convincing data. The sentinel uh, really decreased the uh, stroke rate, so that please do not use a sentinel. I could not convince him. You know, I thought I have very good convincing power, but uh, not <laughs> in this particular case. So they will going to do this case uh, without uh, the, the use of the sentinel device. So, uh, the, so in your practice, how often you are using sentinel now? You know, it's a good question, Samin. We've started using it uh, probably, you know, 80% of cases over the past couple of months, and that number's been increasing. We don't see any downside in terms of risk, and, uh, you know, we're still trying to figure out exactly what the patient, appropriate patient profile is for it. What are your thoughts? Yeah, and I think uh, we're talking to more and more people, both Columbia, then Raj Makar, Cedar Sinai, they're using in uh, the means uh, it's a default approach. You exclude if uh, they don't have a correct anatomy, radial or uh, the uh, tortuosity of the subclavian and innominate, but otherwise they are all using it uh, uh, in the uh, same, 70, 80% of cases. At Sinai, our number is between 30, 35 at present, and so. Uh, so now, the, we, if we can briefly go over this case, uh, then we got to the little vascular access. Uh, next. Uh, these are our disclosure. Next. And uh, so this is the case, 94-year-old, and this is, uh, uh, we know that whole issue of uh, tower getting into the younger and low-risk group. Uh, but this is a patient uh, who is 94, and these are the patients we encountered who had both combination of aortic stenosis and CAD. Uh, now still has class 3 dyspnea on exertion. She had um, earlier, mid last year, had a cath which uh, revealed, uh, actually sorry, January of this year. Uh, cath uh, had a uh, two vessel disease of the LAD and RC, RC was total. We put two stents in the LAD and diagonal and she did okay except still shortness of breath, but that has a complication of perforation of the SFA which required the covered stent. But otherwise patient has done uh, well and uh, have a aortic stenosis, but low flow, low gradient with a normal ejection fraction. So if we can see uh, the next slide, uh, this is uh, basically from echo point of view. And now we actually have the live echo. Uh, Dr. Gila Park is our uh, structural echocardiographer and uh, may just show this is what the live echo now. Gila, you want to curve, uh, sure. comment on? Um, so um, here on the far stern along we see a very calcified aortic valve. We see the patient has a very big left atrium and a pleural effusion. Um, when we um, look a little closer, again, very calcified aortic valve. Not surprising that she has a lot of uh, aortic stenosis. She also has um, aortic insufficiency, moderate AI, moderate MR. And she has very severe tricuspid regurgitation with the right heart uh, enlargement. We can see that on her apical views as well very large biatrial uh, 
uh, enlargement, right side is also big with a normal uh, left ventricular ejection fraction. Also on her pre-image, it's important to point out, just so we know, you know, when we get going with the procedure, she has a small uh, pericardial effusion. Of course, it's not hemodynamically significant. It's just important to remember when we evaluate her post-procedure that we started with uh, this effusion. Okay, so next, uh, so now uh, this is our severe AS and mild AR next. Now this is the whole question was the low flow, low gradient with the dimensionless index of 0 0.22. You want to comment on it because I, yeah, I think so it's more of an echo of uh, uh, the findings and so good LV, you saw it, little hypertrophy, but very symptomatic and valvaria comes out to be 0.7 and uh, this dimensionless index of 0.22. Yeah. Right. So. Um, these are cases that are hard to um, decipher precisely, uh, especially with a normal ejection fraction. The stroke volume index calculates to be low despite the normal ejection fraction. A possible explanation can be, for example, the severe TR that she has that will create you know, a low forward stroke volume. Um, there are several parameters that we can look at when we're assessing this kind of valve, and we're looking to see the valve area, and we're looking to see the dimensionless index, which is the ratio between the flow across the LVOT and across the aortic valve. A ratio that is less than 0.25 is consistent with severe aortic stenosis. Um, when we have low flow, low uh, gradient uh, aortic stenosis with low ejection fraction, we can further evaluate it with a dubutamine echocardio echo echocardiogram um, in order to see if we increase the stroke volume, if we increase the gradient. Uh, however, in a case where we have normal ejection fraction, there is very little uh, role for the bitumen echo, and we have to use other modalities to further define the severity. We can use CAT scan with calcium scoring, we can use hemodynamics from catheterization, um, and things like that. Uh, and we're looking at all these other parameters, as we mentioned the um, dimensionless index, the calculated valve area, the way the valve looks, um, and these okay. things. Okay, next. Uh, next. So, this basically has a high STS risk mortality, as shown here with high Euro score uh, and mean aortic annulus 22.3, uh, lower extremities are peripheral vascular disease, yep. uh, and, uh, and the issue uh, of course uh, the right heavily calcified, uh, we'll come to you in one minute, yeah, and uh, more the, huh? yes, I'm sorry, say it again, okay, yeah, say uh, for echo, mm. yeah, okay, next, okay, now, Jackie, you want to talk about, yeah. Before you go on, I just wanted to ask you, are you doing, uh, you know, echocardiogram. Now, we have moved towards doing a transthoracic, that when they're prepping the patient, they will come and do a transthoracic echo, and uh, same, the echo will be done after the entire case is done, just to check for a PVL and uh, any effusion. How are you guys doing it now? Because you we are moved away from TE unless it, they are, uh, it's really indicated. You know, it's, uh, it's been a move in a, in a very good, healthy direction. I think, uh, you know, roughly 75% uh, of our cases now we do under MAC anesthesia. And uh, uh, with that, we do, as you described exactly, transthoracic at the start of the case and then a quick review transthoracic at the end of the case without uh, transesophageal, which is you know, uh, a couple years ago, I wouldn't have dreamed that we'd be doing it this way, and I think it speeds along the patient's recovery. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Jackie. Good. Good morning, everybody. So, just to take you through the CT and the planning, uh, it's the aortic root angle is 63. So, as you'll see, it's it's somewhat horizontal, not severely horizontal, but uh, that may factor into the way the valve deploys as we get into the case. The annulus, you can see there, the mean um, diameter across the annulus is a little over 22 perimeter of, of about 70, an area of 38, uh, 38, 38, 6 millimeters squared. Importantly, no calcium uh, in the aortic annulus for us to be specifically concerned about today. Next slide, please. You can see here some of the relevant measurements. The STJ height is 20, left main coronary and right main coronary height are both above 12, and so not really a, a problem here as far as coronary uh, occlusion in this case. Yeah, now in this actually the very interesting now, uh, knowing this coronary issues and uh, the whole issue with the sapien versus core valve, the valve overlying the coronary and particularly patients who have CAD. This patient has a complex LAD diagonal requiring rota and two stents, one in the LAD and one in the diagonal and the, if patient comes back, which we expect, patient will live uh, many years after this tower procedure, <laughs> may have a re and so and comes back and then access 
uh, is the issue and that has been actually very uh, highlighted by the uh, pay, our uh, ACC uh, presentation and the paper. Anu, you want to comment on the coronary access in this particular case, if you would have a choice, what will be the valve and uh, what is the whole message say, uh, in a very brief uh, message from the coronary reaccess paper, which is uh, being published today online in the JAC. Yeah, so exactly, I think as we started doing uh, this uh, tower and then we knew these patients were living longer, uh, the initial uh, way was that when you have moderate uh, CAD, where we are saying moderate is even 50, 60, 70 percent lesion, unless it's 90 percent lesion, we never did PCI, we left them alone. So we started seeing patients uh, two years, three years down the road presenting with non-QMI as well as patients uh, presenting with uh, exertional uh, angina. And uh, when we had to do reaccess, uh, that is where we were uh, facing problem, even if it is femoral root, the way, what the kind of catheters that we need to use in both, um, the, especially the core valve as well as sapiens. So what happens is the normal anatomy of the iota where you have an elastic uh, iota is changed to this whole metallic cage that's sitting there. So your normal catheters that we, which were supposed to be doing, like the Jerkins catheter, uh, would not uh, be the right ones to engage the coronaries as well as the placement of the valve with regards to the height, the skirt and the commissure um, which was there. So what we did was went through all the angiograms, they are looked at the, some of the CTs post and then came up with an algorithm saying which are the catheters that could likely fit into all different scenarios and uh, the entire thing was a review article which uh, has been uh, published in JAC uh, this week. Yeah. So good, I think that's a very good, uh, we'll hear lo more about uh, uh, that article and particularly state of the art paper and gives the various algorithm and so and uh, our surgeon actually, uh, Dr. <coughs> Gilbert Tang did a lot of work in that. So you want to comment on also because uh, we a lot of input was put by the surgeon in yeah. this uh, coronary access paper. I think the implication from a surgical point of view is the low risk trial that's already currently being completed and the results will be available next year. So in low risk patients with moderate CAD as Dr. Kinney mentioned, what will be the prognosis of these patients once they have a TAVR which we know have good durability in terms of reaccess? I mean that's really the crux of the question that we are working on right now and often as Dr. Sharma and Dr. Kinney alluded to, a lot of these patients present with CAD at the peripheral hospital and often uh, limited by their experience with TAVR, unlike a tertiary center like Mount Sinai. So this paper hopefully will give a kind of reference uh, to the anatomy and also some of the tool sets that the cardiologists can use when they face this uh, challenge. All right, okay, we continue with our slide presentation. Uh, next. Good, so one of the challenges in this case was the access. And as we've already heard, the patient has a covered stent in the right uh, SFA. So you can see the left is a little more torture. It's actually sort of a corkscrew in the left, both fairly heavily diseased, as you can see there. Next slide. Uh, this is the right, which is actually the preferred vessel because it's actually a little less tortuous, although it's hard to appreciate in this 2D rendering. But you can see, uh, you probably can't read it, but some of the uh, the calcified points get down to an area of about four and a half to five millimeters with significant sort of 180 degree calcification. Next slide. The left was much the same, although somewhat more tortuous. Uh, so in the end, being very respectful of the, of the fact this patient's had a right femoral perforation, we elected to go with the uh, core valve system with a plan up front to try to go in line with the um, Evolute Pro if that was favorable as we're getting into the access. Next slide. Uh, this was as we were contemplating the Sentinel device, but as you've heard, we're not going ahead with the Sentinel, but it was favorable nonetheless for Sentinel placement. Next. Yep. So therefore, basically, a uh, patient uh, evaluated by heart team, by every me means it's a high risk or maybe even extreme risk in my opinion, and uh, patient is here for tower. Next. So the valve-wise, so decided today the pro, which is the additional cuff to decrease the yep. re regurgitation and it fits into with a 26 millimeter Evolute Pro. Next. So this is where we are now, the tower with a 26 millimeter Metronic Evolute Pro core valve by transfemoral access, right percutaneous, with planned sentinel cerebral protection, which was uh, not planned now, but that was originally our um, 
the plan was so now we are ready uh, just show these. tell us uh, okay now to show the floor now we are good right there yeah so just to take you up to what we've done so far we took the this minor axis side on the left this we put a six french sheath in here you can see significant disease on the on the left side there we yeah. passed a wire up and over passed a v18 wire down to the right knee you can see the covered stent there is in the proximal sfa that was the site of rupture we're, we're sticking a lot higher than that today so we're nowhere near that covered stent the access point on the right we do this i do this to sort of help delineate the fluoro and the access point you can see in the mid common femoral is significant calcification we knew all that from the ct so we stuck here above that calcium high in the uh, right common femoral artery now we've aligned our root shot and so we've got good angles and the next thing we should do is check the valve because we haven't yet checked the valve before okay. we start crossing good let's bring the valve so bring the valve and we can just show you how we do this the valve have been correctly crimped so the valve's been loaded okay do you want to But important to check that the valve is aligned and the paddles are seated evenly. You can see there the paddles are seated nice and evenly. So I've got a successful load here and we're ready to go. Happy? Uh, now we have what, AR2? Uh, oh good, went in. Uh. <laughs> no, came out. We are the wire ready, guys? So we use AR2 usually if it's a dilated root and when you kind of using a 34 uh, uh, valve then we'll use uh, AL1 but AR2 is uh, works out in majority and then we use a stiff uh, shaft uh, straight the room of wire. So there is a little deterioration of this floral image in this room now. Uh, make sure we call the our X-ray friends and the company people to make it a little better. So, I mean, it looks yeah. like uh, the aortic angle, as you mentioned, is 63 degrees, which is pretty acute. Is there, is there any consideration uh, there, uh, anything you do differently when it's so acutely angulated during deployment? Yeah, but I mean, I just basically that makes sure that uh, clearly uh, the jiggle, that there's no tension, and that is the key so the valve doesn't pop up. Uh, we, you know, usually it's a, very rarely it's more inside, it's a issue remains. Um, the valve, uh, you know, popping out all the which with the uh, newer generation Pro and uh, R, that actually has become very little. Uh, I don't remember now putting a valve in valve in many, many years now. I agree, uh, I agree. It's more stable. These yeah. valves are more stable. Yeah. Okay, now we are AR2, so we are going to change it to a uh, pigtail after the yeah, valve blast. Right? Can you show the yeah. hemodynamics, sir? Will be the low gradient. Damien, fix this. Yeah, one of the femoral you can close. Close fix one of the femoral, so confusing. All right, for us in yeah. your experience with Pro versus R in terms of the deployment, since you uh, were just talking about that. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I think the Pro is a good valve. I, you know, I, I like both. Uh, um, you know, I'm not sure if I've noticed a big difference in terms of stability. I think they're both fairly stable. Uh, I, I like the fact that the Pro adds that added skirt, you know, uh, there. Have you noticed anything appreciable? Yeah, just the regurgitation at time zero is less with the Pro. Yeah. yeah. And also, yeah. we felt at least in terms of unreleased, the pivot is a little bit less. So uh, you have a little more, uh, better, con more control with the Pro. Mm. And maybe due to the friction with this, this uh, ex extra pericardial wrap, that's possible. But certainly, that's we've, we've noticed uh, some of the cases with that. Are you routinely doing a pre-BAV? We do routinely do pre-BAV on these cases. Uh, we find that it decreases the incidence of post dilatation, which we don't really love to do. And yeah. We find that we get some more stability out of it uh, by doing it, you know, the pre-BAV routinely. Yeah, I, I think that's a, the, the real go very good point. I know a lot of people are concerned mm. about uh, uh, go with the no-touch technique, yeah. that no BAV, no post. Right. But uh, you, you know, if you don't do pre, definitely there is higher chance of post dilating. Yes. And to me, I think the post dilatation is a little more troublesome than pre. Yes. Okay. Now, which uh, now we are using the confida, confida. wire. Yeah. What uh, wire are you using? We have gone through all. 
Super yeah. stiff, exercise <laughs> stiff. Now the confida has become our routine. Yes, we've done the same. You know, uh, uh, we use the confida on every case. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, um, we love the pigtail at the end of this wire, and we think it's a very safe wire. Okay. Echo wise, right? Nothing echo. We don't use it. Okay. So we are the 20 millimeter uh, BAV balloon. Okay. So you size your balloon to the minor axis. Yes, exactly. So many times actually <laughs> they use 18 millimeter balloon and the real valve plastic. I never used 18 millimeter <laughs> unless patient was in cardio and shock. Right. They all, uh, my, you know, I get a lot of resistance if I say 18 in the minor and I use 20. Huh? <laughs> no, we are used to 18 here. Yeah. Take this out now. Yeah. So now whole idea is that we go with the inline sheet and we hold it hold there. It. Yeah. Yeah. Hold it. Take uh -huh. it out. Let it bleed a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that's the same point also that if you you planning to use inline sheath and I to me I mean the, the mat should be able to get a little smarter. smarter. So it's a, so simple to dissociate this, their sheath. But only problem is what you have to take out you have to take out the entire unit. Yes. And I'm surprised that they have not been able to get to this hump that uh, the With able the to diso you know yeah. detach yeah. the inline sheath. Even, uh, uh, you know, for the impella and so they have made a lot of changes in their sheath. Detachable and so, but they need to do a little extra work on this. It's such a simple thing. I mean, they can definitely uh, separate. I think it's a good point to add yeah. some versatility uh, and, and some separation p potential between the sheath and the delivery device. That's yep. a very good point. Let's see, wire is okay there. Wire is coming back. Wire is coming wire, back. Wire, okay, wire. Wire. Push Advanced. the wire. Yep. Push the Done. wire. Push the wire. Go back down. Yeah, the chico is here. Okay. Hold the, the, the wire back a little bit. Yep. Pull back. Good. Look at the tortuosity. Very tortuous. <laughs> Keep going. Okay. Okay, go to regular. Yeah. Floro. Go ahead, Rick. Hold the wire, right? Yep. Go floor. I yes, have, I have. Don't tell me it's dead. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Do you utilize controlled pacing for deployment? Yes. Yes. For deployment, I think it's just a 120 or so. Yeah. yeah. So that's exactly. So once, particularly when you release the um, maybe 20, 25 percent of it. Good. Good. Okay, wait. I'm going to see there. Okay. Wait. What do you have? Uh oh, oh. It's going out there. Okay. Good. Yeah, okay, good. okay, okay. I'm going to see there. Yeah. Inject. Yeah. Okay, nice. It looks like a nice position. Yeah. Okay, so I'm dying now again. Inject. Okay. So far, so far. Yep. Yeah. Okay, start pacing at 150. We pace just before it flares, so right now, see that? It'll flare and anchor and go back to 80 pacing. That's very nice. That's where you get the pop outs. Yeah, inject. Looking very good. Looking good, yeah. no? Right. Very good. nice deployment. Not a lot of get parallax. Okay, if we are happy, we'll Try. release it, right? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good? I think, oh, just the parallax out. I think it's fine. Good. Okay, good. Just okay, parallax out. out. Yeah. Yeah, uh, parallax is out. Yeah, that's, that's good. Good. Mm -hmm. That was good. Pigtail, bye-bye. Yeah. Perfect, yeah, yeah good. good. Okay, good. 
Okay. So Star, you want facing? Yeah, pull the wire back. Yeah. 120 face? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm going forward. Okay, back to 80. Right. Very one stable. Tap two, one tap two, one tap yes, yes. Okay, okay now go. Okay. okay. Advance the wire a little bit. Okay. Low mag. Good. That's very Perfect. nice. Perfect. Okay, let's bring the. You see the how horizontal the valve as you pointed out with that angle. You know, yeah. it's it it's it, it can be very difficult. You yeah. made it look very nice. Okay. Take a picture. Okay, ready? Yep. Inject. Okay, good. Nice. Leave it alone. Oh, good. Let's do then do the echo. Yeah, yeah. For us. Okay. Very good. <laughs> Show the hemodynamics back. No, but we are Diastolic pressure, which was. Oh. Oh, Before, yeah. are they showing the hemos now? Yeah. Show the hemodynamic tracing. Good. Good. The diastolics were in the 70s. Now we are in the 80s. Oh. Right? What is the second pressure? Flush. Which one? That is from here. Yeah, flush, you want yeah. to take it out? Yeah. Oh, flush. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. no, but one. You know, there is a difference. So once you are there, just make sure that whatever we are seeing is correct. And let's see the on echo performance of the valve. The other one. This one I did already. Wrong. Can you open the yellow? Right. No, it's open. It's there. That's the one. You need to flush and just take a right now both in the aorta. Oh. Yeah. You get a nice view of the super annular nature yeah. of the valve leaflets here. It's a beautiful yeah. view. You can see it, yes. <laughs> Whatever, machine, echo machine busted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to all these machines. When you really want Four the desktop. No? Yeah. No, I can't. Okay. Fluoroscopy yeah. wise, we are good. <laughs> yeah. So, Raj, you mentioned about the horizontal aorta. What, what tricks um, do you have uh, for the audience in terms of uh, deploying uh, the Evolut? Right. You know, I think uh, you have to be mindful of the uh, uh, of the lower edge, you know, of the of the stent on the non-coronary side. Um, y you know, if you're if you're uh, pulled towards the lesser curve of the aorta, then you sort of have a sense that it'll cant back towards the non-coronary side, and vice versa. If it's towards the outer curve, uh, then you have a sense that it might cant towards the left. I, you know, it's it's. Typically not as easy as you all made it look today. Um, did, were you manipulating the wire there to get a good deployment at all? Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, we we try to see ex exactly what you said, the delivery caster in terms of orientation across the annulus. Certainly, as you said, if you have, have towards the lesser curve, you could be up a little bit deeper on the left. So, you, so I think the first thing we saw in this case was that we tried to center the caster as much as possible across the analyst so we don't have to recapture or we try to be able to aim a little higher on the non uh, versus so that will be uh, it will be just about symmetric on the deployment yes uh, and uh, I mean the diastolic I mean one thing is always the acute performance we see based on the diastolic pressure which is quite well and same thing is with the repeat autogram after the wire has been removed and it's an inline sheet uh, just to say it so that we don't have to do any more exchanges. Uh, it's a diastolic pressure of uh, 70, uh, 80. And we always, uh, you know, before starting the procedure, we write it what was the diastolic pressure was before, and I think that's a good gauge. In questionable cases, should you post dilate or not post dilate? Yeah, I would, I would agree. I, you know, uh, this is a very nice result. I don't think I'd go after it at all. Tell them, no. Okay. Gila, you want to say? Yeah. Yeah, it looks, uh, from this view, it looks good. Yeah. We're not seeing any paravalvular AI. And, um, and same uh, also that we are using uh, the about 78% uh, of cases last year uh, were under uh, MAC. And still, the ones in the alternate axis in our center still remains subclavian as mm -hmm. the preferred approach. I know a mm -hmm. lot of people are using cable, the axillary and so. So what is your, and trans has completely disappeared. We haven't done any trans case last year. The one we did two years ago. 
So what is uh, in your practice? Yeah, we, you know, we actually also like the subclavian approach very much. So, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a minimally invasive approach. It's a direct shot. Uh, you know, obviously you have a lot of expertise with that approach. Um, we, we like it very much as well. We still occasionally, I mean, it's, it's few and far between, but we occasionally have a transapical case and in, in a situation where the anatomy elsewhere is unfavorable. But I agree with you that subclavian is a great alternative. Okay, while we are doing the vascular, so we can uh, quickly present the uh, rest of our didactic discussion if we can go back to the slide. And that has been the hot topic. Uh, go next. Okay, next. And that is the latest one now. And this is the hot topic at present. Whether tower will survive, in my opinion, in a simple word, against surgery in the low-risk patient. And you'll say why. And I'll tell you why. Next. So clearly, this is actually took me a little time to make this slide. The extreme risk, we are on the top. Then the high risk, partner 1A and Corval. Then we are intermediate risk, partner 2A and Sertavi. All have been put together so far. We are equal or if not ahead uh, of the surg surgical valve. And then of course the notion trial data, which is one year and I'll show you the five year data. Next. Uh, so next, the so three trials, notion already completed. We have five year next. All cases were with the core valve and two both partner three with a sapien completed in September. And uh, the evolute uh, uh, the pro or uh, R, which completed yesterday. Yesterday was the last day of randomization for the Evolute R. So we got actually three cases <laughs> yesterday, uh, randomized. Next. So basically the notion trial was the trial of uh, next, uh, about 100 and, uh, I mean 270 patients, but low STS risk of less than three. That was the purpose. So what happens into the low risk group? We know intermediate high and so. Next. And uh, all these cases were with the core valve. Uh, and of course, there are some data of the surgery. Next. And basically, this was the one year, uh, two, two, three years ago, was published with one year data showing that at one year, the red is the surgical and uh, the uh, tower is in the blue, numerically lower mortality as well as the stroke between two groups. Next. And then, of course, these were uh, individual numbers. Uh, you can see very clear was the permanent pacemaker, much higher and largely because these are the core valve cases. We know that with the Edward, that number is about 12 to 15 percent. And of course, the vascular complication and major life-threatening bleed is usually more surgical disease. Next. So then we have the very important observation, which we knew uh, by other valve trials too, that by aortic transcatheter, you are tower, you get a better valve area compared to surgical. Next. Uh, and uh, next, so this is a nice, uh, uh, the really, that notion trial was no significant difference. Next. A nice editorial showing that well-intended notion ahead of the practice. Because 2015, we're still trying to do those two low-risk uh, trials. Next. Uh, then we have the four-year data presented last year. Next, but more important is let's go to the five-year, which was presented day before yesterday in the ACC of the notion. Next. And basically showed that a five-year is a dead heat with the mortality stroke at five. Both identical 35-39%. Uh, so, uh, and next, and these are the individual endpoints. Identical mortality, 27.7 and 27.7. Would you believe that? Exactly identical. The stroke rate, you can see with the tower later on, initially was numerically lower, but uh, just like numerically 2% higher. The MI identical pacemaker continues to be a trouble in the tower because the core valve, as we know, aortic valve reintervention. 2.5% of cases uh, in the tower group required, and that's the data R. The tower lasts for five to six years, and about three to four percent of cases you reintervene. And endocarditis, again, no difference. Next. Now, this is the key. And key is the performance of the aortic valve from one, the tower valve 1.66 at three months and 1.66 at five years. Remain sustained, uh, and then clearly. The aortic valve surgery also, but slight decline, but more importantly, whatever was attained acutely remained good for five years. Next. So, and then aortic valve regurgitation. That's the price we paid with the tower. As you can see, with the two plus, if you take even the moderate to severe, eight percent versus zero percent with surgery. Once you go to moderate, mild, definitely even much higher in the tower group. So, higher chance of mild prosthetic 
regurgitation or aortic valve regurgitation, definitely the moderate to severe is only in the tower group, not in the surgery group. Next. And this is, a, this is actually very reassuring. Despite all those, the NYHA class, both of them are 90 plus percent in the class 1 and 2. So that is the key. Uh, yeah, so definitely the, those patients who have regurgitation still do well with the medical therapy. Next. And then this is, this, these are the two important slides I am going to share now. One is association of the new pacemaker with the mortality. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the, clearly that the patients who got the pacemaker had a higher mortality compared to uh, that, uh, uh, those who did not get a pacemaker. So one thing we learned, pacemaker has higher mortality. If you put a pacemaker, five-year mortality was higher. Next. And then this was the, based on the three months of the aortic regurgitation severity. So no much difference, mild to moderate. So it turns out to be, remember this was the classical old core valve. And the, since then, the new generation will decrease the regurgitation. But I think it's, we learned that. Unless you are to be extremely severe, there's no difference. Even here, you can see in the mild moderate to severe, 22 versus 30.8, basically no difference in mortality. Difference was if you got a new pacemaker. Next. So basically, it's the first of the trial which showed this comparison. Uh, and uh, difference in no difference in prosthetic valve intervention and opening area was larger. Tower continues to have more mild to moderate PR and new pacemaker implantation of a tower tended to be associated with increased mortality. So this is very important point, particularly when we are thinking about this valve with younger patients. Next. So on the heel of this comes this new, uh, it has head of the pub uh, paper in this, uh, the cath cardiovascular diagnosis. The transcatheter versus surgical aortic valve replacement in patients at low surgical risk. A meta-analysis of randomized trial and propensity score matched. Next. And these are the various trials. Next. And uh, these are the basically have looked into uh, some randomized. Next. Uh, and uh, the number of patients and the follow-up. Next. And basically showed that short-term mortality was identical in the randomized as well as in the propensity match analysis between tower and sour. Next. The problem happened at the follow-up. Between one to two years, this is not a long-term follow-up because notion is the only one we got to the five years. But key is, you see here, the at because of the propensity match, not because of the randomized, because of the propensity match, you see a better outcome favoring sour versus tower. Next, and this is where I put it here, short-term mortality and intermediate to 17.2 in the tower group and uh, 12.7 in the surgical group and which a very high p-value. So uh, do you have any comment on it? Uh, uh, you know, uh, the striking information for me comes in the aortic valve reinterventions. You know, everyone wants to know. Yeah. And it, it, it's clear that the rates from the Notion trial are very low, almost negligible. And yeah. so I think that's a very important conclusion from this study. Okay. Okay, next. So therefore, they did, actually, these are the individual other complications which are not different. Next, except the pacemaker, which we know. So they actually concluded, and this was a big uh, web news, and so that in patients who are at low surgical risk seems to be associated with the increased mortality risk. Uh, um, uh, until more data in this population is available, surgery, surgical valve replacement should remain the treatment of choice for these patients. Now, I know that observational data are different than the randomized. Even in this paper, if you take a randomized data, there's no difference, even in the late mortality. If when you combine propensity match, which I don't know, it's a, may, more of a statistical fluke. So, you know, even we have trial negative, we torture the data of those trials till some subgroup becomes positive. So that's kind of my observation on this one is next. And this leads to that one of the important issues for us to win for the tower community is that well durability. And this is what we really need to uh, focus on and a lot of work with the ongoing trials to emphasizing uh, and evaluating this tower, uh, the leaflet issue. Next. So therefore, uh, encouraging results of the Notion trial, reporting five-year outcome comparing tower versus sour, showed similar mortality, stroke and mace, outcome with higher residual PR and permanent pacemaker. These data have provided the glimpses of the other low-risk trial results. Next. Uh, future efforts need to focus on reducing the need of permanent pacemaker and prosthetic regurgitation after tower, both of which can be associated with higher mortality at follow-up. Also, prospective long-term follow-up for 5 to 10 years with a special focus on tower leaflet thickening, 
deterioration will be required to really establish tower use in younger patient. Somehow my two other slides, can we go back? The why those two randomized the, the both trials which have been done minus? Yeah, sorry, somehow we missed it. Uh, so basically you know that both partner three uh, completed last September, which will have one year outcome expected in ACC of 2019, which has both uh, the death, stroke and repeat hospitalization, one year outcome. Then the, uh, of the, uh, the evolute low risk has a two year outcome of the death and stroke, which likely will be presented, completed yesterday, likely will be presented in AHA of 2020. So there definitely will be about 15, 18 months behind the sapient trial results that was, have been for all the partners and uh, the core well trials. So I think it's a very exciting uh, arena. Just go quickly the three questions which we have. The one is the following are the five year true outcomes of the notion trial comparing tower versus sour in low risk AS patients except similar mortality between two groups, similar moderate to severe AR and PR between two groups, similar aortic valve re intervention between two groups, similar stroke rates between two groups and higher permanent pacemaker rate with tower versus sour. Next. So answer there is B, similar moderate to severe ARPR, no, it is higher with the tower group. Next question, following are the true statement regarding the notion trial, comparing tower versus sour, trial included AS patients with STS of less than three, core valve tower was used, which was the classical core valve, not the evolute R or pro, patient who required permanent pacemaker had higher mortality at follow-up, tower patients had higher aortic valve area as sour at follow-up or all are correct. Next, clearly all are correct. The third question, the following issues need to be considered carefully regarding the tower use in younger and low risk patients except tower leaflet thickening and deterioration, need for permanent pacemaker, residual prosthetic regurgitation, coronary reaccess which we emphasized earlier and effective aortic valve area. So I think in of the five, we don't need to worry about effective aortic valve area. Next, that's the answer because that has been established by all the trials the tower will have give you a b effective larger aortic um, valve area compared to surgery. More we need to focus on other aspects that have to have valve where maybe they can, uh, there could be, they can align with the ostium of uh, this we actually put in the uh, perspective in our uh, paper. So align to the ostium of these major vessels and of course the valve which will not uh, impinge over the height of the valve is smaller so it doesn't impede impinge and then of course the durability of the and avoiding the pacemaker. Pacemaker, pacemaker, pacemaker avoidance is one of the important focus on us now. I think the you past used to be stroke. Stroke I think we have eliminated or significantly decreased. Vascular complications all have significantly decreased. What we really work on the valve, uh, the, the durability and avoiding the pacemaker and maybe some new design which will have and of course the regurgitation has decreased with the newer valve, Sapien 3 as well as with the Evolute Pro. The issue will remain is just avoiding the pacemaker. Okay, so now. Just show yeah. I'll just show you the final closure of the case here. The angios, please. Good, so what we've done here is we still, we have an 018 wire up and over from the left, which is the minor axis down to the right knee. We've retracted the Evolute system back into the external iliac and you see a first DSA shot just to make sure there's no perforation or trouble. The next step is to actually r fully remove the Evolute system and deploy the perclosed sutures with, uh, this was a 7040 balloon we had at the access site. And you can see just below us is the, the site of the previous perforation. So after deploying the perclosed sutures, the 30 seconds of balloon inflation, low pressure, just three atmospheres. This is the final shot with nice closure, nice hemostasis, no leak, no problem, so um, Beautiful. successful. So before we conclude, I'll ask my uh, group and mm. then ask you uh, about this. So based on the data we have, are we concerned? Anu, are we concerned? And then Gilbert, you'll answer. Are we concerned about the trial results of the low risk? Yeah, I think, mm. the, you know, but even when we look at intermediate risk, I think surgery loses because of the new AFib bleeding and acute renal injury. Yep. Uh, and and they win on the paraviral leak and pacemaker. So I think ultimately for low risk, it'll be a trade-off. Once it's approved, you're gonna have to have the patient decide based on these trade-offs what they're willing to accept. I think that's really the question. We talk about coronary access, obviously valve and valve is another discussion that we need to talk about. Certainly with surgical valve, we know valve and valve is mostly possible. With tower, 
at least right now we don't know yet whether everyone is possible. You know, obviously there will be new technologies down the road. I think those are discussions we need to we need to talk about. Great. I know. Low risk, I think only two things like you guys have mentioned would be the pacemaker rate, which you are talking about 60 year old, uh, the mm -hmm. pacemaker uh, would not be, and a reaccess. To me, mm -hmm. as an interventionist, reaccess is the key. So I can tell you, every complex case, we will be done in a uh, half hour, 45 minutes. When we see the patient has had a prior uh, tower, we all want to run away from the room now. <laughs> 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 okay, your opinion now. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think it's a, a question that still remains to be answered. There's a lot of good data still coming. I think durability has always been an issue and a question, and, and it seems like durability is going to hold up. I share the concerns of the group regarding pacemaker and paravalvular leak rates, although I think, it, you know, as the generations and iterations of devices move forward, we'll probably have better results in those categories with TAVR. So, you know, I, I think it's sort of a flip of a coin at this point, but we have a lot of data ready to still come. Okay. Good. All right. So we conclude our today's uh, transmission. And uh, thanks uh, for our viewers uh, and uh, any questions and uh, uh, post the questions. And for the our earlier, uh, all the episodes have been archived and can get access to uh, to get the slide as well as uh, uh, the procedural tips and tricks. Thank, thank you. you thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to take a moment to thank the Hart team for an expertly performed case and very informative presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank you again also on behalf of everyone for joining us today. Uh, as Dr. Sharma mentioned, this recording will be archived on www.ccclivecases.org later today. Uh, Structural Heart Live Cases occurs every month, every other month on Tuesday at 9 a.m. The next session will be on Tuesday, May 8th at 9 a.m. Thank you again for joining us today.